Hi, this is Ann Hill from Dream Talk Radio, and today I get to interview one of my favorite people, Ryan Hurd. And Ryan is a dream researcher and an author of several books. Most recently, and the one we're going to be talking about today is Big Dreams, Psy, Lucid Dreaming, and the Borderlands of Consciousness. It is in ebook, as you can see right there, and we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about this and how to get it in a little bit. But Ryan, welcome. Hey, thank you. Thanks uh, for uh, taking the time again to talk to me. This is great. I think I think it was last year around this time, wasn't it, that we yeah. sat here oh. around the virtual. <laughs> Almost exactly a year ago, I think it was late January that we were talking, and I was in a different house at the time. Um, <laughs> I've moved since then. Oh wow! Um, but um, yeah, yeah, one ebook later, here I am again. <laughs> Very cool. Well, well, so okay, big dreams, big topic. Um, your first, and this is part of the Dream Like a Boss. You can kind of see part two, book two of the Dream Like a Boss. Series and the first one was kind of an overview, it's like a survey of dream research, sleep, dreams, how it all kind of fits, what, how to even think about dreams, and then you kind of got into this stuff a little at the end, and now you got the whole book about big dreams. So um, let's first actually define what what we're talking about. How would you? What's your thumbnail definition of a big dream? Well, uh, mostly the book is about, I guess you could say, extraordinary dreams. Okay. Uh, the most memorable dreams, the, the fantastic dreams, the dreams you remember, the dreams that change you. Um, I, it's actually pretty open and uh, because there's lots of different reasons why dreams are fantastic and memorable and beyond the pale. And so, yeah, that's kind of what it's about. So that, you know, it really runs the gamut between... You know, talking about lucid dreaming and also psychic dreams, you know, maybe telepathy in dreams, ancestral dreams, uh, and and sleep, you know, nightmares and how they can just kind of take us beyond into the archetypal realms that right. are beyond the personality. So yeah, I'm kind of just was like everything that's weird and freaky about dreams. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, go. Okay. <laughs> so, as yeah, I mean, look at looking at the table of contents. You've got side dreaming, visitations, ancestors. I mean, I hardly know where to start. Then a big thing on lucid dreams, um, sexual lucid dreaming, lucid dreams and spirituality, lucid nightmares, and then you got the, your your sleep paralysis, your night terrors. You got your hypnagogic hallucinations and false awakenings. So, wow. Now, I, I guess I want to back up a little bit because um, it's not every dream researcher who just jumps into this big pool into the deep end like this. What what prompted the book in the first place? Well, I mean, actually, the book a lot of it is adapted material from my blog that I've written over the last few years, and I sort of. I've I've already been out about writing this stuff about extraordinary material, and I was like I need to just compile it, and that's what the whole Dream Like a Boss series actually is. Is it's it's more or less sort of the most popular, the most useful, um, and practical uh, posts on my blog, uh, how to do dream work and how to apply it in your life, and it is including research, but research you can use, and so that's kind of that was my you know, decider. I want to talk about this research, but only if it's practical um, and something that we could like actually apply in our lives today. And so that's true with the big dream stuff too. Right. And so talking about how how false awakenings when you think that you're dreaming or you think you're awake and then you realize that you're dreaming, right. uh, that's something that someone most people have had at least once in their life, and it's really creepy. Um, and then putting that in, in a bigger context of lucidity and metacognition. Uh, and some of the other things that we, that we kind of the book gets into, and, uh, and there's not really an, necessarily an integrative function at the end. I don't have a big theory about it all. Um, I do talk at the end more about how dreams and ecology fit together, and how I think psi might kind of be an off product of of sort of a, a larger us, you know, kind of along the, the way that Jung used to talk about collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's not really about big theories. It's just about noticing your experiences, honoring them, 
in terms of remembering them and also acting on them and, and sharing them. And because I think, yeah, you know, ultimately there's so many taboos around big dreams. Right. Uh, some of these experiences are just really strange. Um, but when you add them all together, you realize that everyone's got a story, you know. And, and I mean, I haven't experienced all of these kinds of big dreams. I just haven't. But I've had a couple of them, and it's been enough to make me realize that I can't just disregard other people's accounts of their own extraordinary experiences, even though, like, rationally, I want to just say, no, 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 that's not really happening. Um, that would be very convenient for me to just disregard it. Um, but I'm, so I'm kind of asking for, let's just open up the conversation. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. I mean, I found myself, okay, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm into this stuff too. And, um, but even, it was interesting reading the book to notice where my, like, eye rolling began. Right? There's a couple ones that I'm, like, rolling my eyes at the whole idea of, like, ancestral dreams. Well, I mean, I've had dreams of my ancestors. I mean, I, that's not a, it's not out of the realm of ordinary in my own dream life. So it was interesting to feel that, like, oh, God, now people are going to take this freak flag and run with it, and it's going to be totally misconstrued, and we're going to get, we're going to go off the, onto the woo train to, no, you know, nowheresville. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You got to notice your resistances, you know, because that's where the juice is. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. But but I think that uh, well, so let's start someplace. Let's just start. Let's. Uh, you brought up false awakenings. That's actually a great place to start. I mean, that's something that I hear about a lot actually from people, and it's not something that I've had a lot of experience with. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about what what it is and uh, kind of how to think about it if you can work and process it during the false awakening or at least afterwards because I know a lot of people get really freaked out they tried to wake up and they were in another dream and then they were in another dream and they couldn't wake up it's kind of nightmarish yeah it, it really can be and, and my, I have had false awakenings and they it's almost it's like inception you can be like four dreams in is what it feels like and you'll wake up into another layer and, and you'll think you're awake and then you kind of you know go about padding around the house and then you walk through a door and you fall into a you know, chasm uh, of snakes and then it starts over again and, and, and it's, it's one of these it makes you question your sanity in the moment and that's because you're dreaming um, but what's so strange about false awakenings which I think is underappreciated is that there's a lot of it's very similar in terms of cognition style to waking life. Like we have our waking life kind of thinking sensibilities, our inner monologue, our sense of self, uh, and at the same time you've got a very clear representation of your, of your life. So uh, there's not problems with, with memory recall, and so it's not dreamy. Um, uh -huh. That's why it's so weird. Uh, and, and what this is, is in, in, from the lucid dreaming community, it's often kind of discussed as a pre-lucid dream uh, in the sense of that you've got all this metacognition and if you can just realize you're dreaming, then you can, you know, take control of it and make choices and kind of go off into a lucid dreaming world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's an actually pretty good point. But I also, you know, think that if you take a more naturalistic approach, that false awakenings, they're, own, they're their own phenomena. Um, and it's not, there's no shoulds in dreams. I'm very uh, strident about that. No one, you know, a false awakening is not a failed lucid dream if uh -huh. you don't realize it until you wake up. Um, right. It's just something that happens. And they tend to happen in the morning. They tend to happen when the brain is waking up uh, and there's sort of, you know, longer REM sessions. There's probably higher cortical activity going on. All these sort of things that are very similar to lucid dreams. Uh, except that very specific knowing that you're dreaming and so you kind of get blah surprised by it. <laughs> some people, man, some people really suffer. Uh, I mean, I, you know, one of the accounts in the dream uh, in the book was about this guy who actually recalls driving for you know an hour going to work and he remembers the entire drive as he goes to work uh, before you know the reality kind of begins to break down. It's just very, how can that be, you know? Yeah, right. 
So, so what do you do in that situation? I mean, how do you get out of it? Well, yeah. So, so with false awakenings, uh, in the end, it's it's about it's about waking up and splashing water on your face and essentially doing lucid dreaming type things to actually determine if you're awake or not. Mm -hmm. um, and these are called reality checks in the lucid dreaming world. And one of the most reliable one is to is to look at text, uh, a nice long string of text, look away and then come back and see if it's the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's a dream, it'll be different. And, then, and if it's a waking life, it won't. And, and that's just because text, for whatever reason, is very unstable in, in dreams. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, in, in that section of your book, you talk about um, false awakenings as being you're, you're aware, but you're not awake. And I really love that distinction, and I don't think a, um, a lot of people have um, are, are used to thinking in that way. Like awareness is different from, from waking and sleeping. And that seems to actually kind of be a theme. I mean, you talked earlier about metacognition. So let's, let's try and tease those two things out. What is the difference between being awake and being aware? Yeah, I mean, I just think we have a general assumption in waking in Western civilization that being asleep means not being aware, not being conscious, and that's a confusion, I think, of this, our states of consciousness and what's happening with our bodies. Uh, of course, you see in other cultures that dreams are times for getting information, times for visiting relatives. Um, and, and then there's like the spiritual communities like Tibetan Buddhism where dreams are a time for meditation and a time for you know checking in with with the teachers and things like that so it's very bizarre for us to just say hey dreaming sleeping is no awareness and it's not true I mean because if we were really if we weren't conscious at all in our dreams we wouldn't recall them they would not be a process that we had in the first place the truth is somewhere in between in metacognition we should be, you know, be thinking about your thinking, uh, having a level of witness on your processes. It can include, you know, um, thinking about your feelings, noticing when you're angry. That's emotional intelligence. It's a really useful kind of, uh, you know, um, thing to have because when you realize you're feeling things, you can put stops on yourself and prevent yourself from embarrassing yourself. Uh, right? <laughs> handy. Really yeah. handy. So, so metacognition is, is a higher level thinking, uh, and, and it happens in dreams all the time. And so, false awakening is one of these extreme times. And because we don't have a language for it, it, it catches people off guard, and that's why it becomes so nightmarish. It's like, hey, I'm in a very clear thinking space, uh, and then suddenly I'm in a dreaming space, and those two ideas become extraordinarily scary. Yeah. Um, but once you make room for, oh. I'm aware in a dream, and then curiosity can overcome the fear, and, and from there you can explore your dream world, uh, decide to wake up if you choose to. Uh, one of my favorite methods is blinking my eyes, just, you know, like this. Uh huh. And, and it, it'll break the dream up, and, and often it actually breaks the actual REM paralysis. Uh huh. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, I, and I, I love how you, you know, in each one of these things that you highlight in the book, there's really, you get a really strong dose of the science about it. Like you just said, okay, there's REM paralysis going on, there's frontal lobe activity, there's this, you know, cord you know all that stuff. Like, yeah, I have a friend who knows this stuff. <laughs> Maybe I don't have to learn it myself, but it's really interesting. I think it takes some of the, the sting out of it because there's, I mean, there's such a stigma. I don't know where we get this, Freud maybe, or the church, who knows where this all comes from, but when you have things that smack of uh, the paranormal, to you know, that then you're somehow out of, the, out of the game, you're somehow a freak of nature, and so just breaking it down like you do in terms of brain activity, and like for instance, in in night terrors and nightmares, you talk about the difference between you know your body being a, uh, awake and your mind is asleep, and you know so there's these these sort of splits in the mind body. It's really a helpful way to to frame that kind of stuff. Thanks. I, 
I have trouble trying to get. Let me try. Let's start this over. Maybe you can edit this out. <laughs> uh, in fact, what's going on right now with me is that there's this echo happening with uh, as I talk, and it's it's making my brain go crazy. <laughs> oh, do you wanna do you wanna take out the earbuds and try it without? Is let that gonna Let me try it. I just don't want to mess up the recording. That's okay. It's it's a Google Hangout. Come on. Is that a little is that a little better? Oh yeah. Oh no. <laughs> I hear myself now in my speakers. Take this out. I'll plug it in, but I'll keep the speaker close to me. Oh okay. Yeah, you probably don't need the speakers if you've got the. Hopefully. Okay. Now this actually is gonna work. Okay. I think I'm just gonna let it like be like this because this is better. Okay. And so long as your brain isn't hurting, that's we we don't want any headaches <laughs> to ensue. <laughs> uh, thinking about consciousness can be a, can be a headache. <laughs> okay. Well, then never mind. So <laughs> I, I'll, I'm off and running to the next thing because um, in lucid dreams, I I want to sort of take this idea of metacognition. You know, the 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 idea that we can like you said, emotional intelligence, right? I'm aware of what I'm feeling and so I get a little bit of a distance and I'm able to witness my emotional stream of consciousness and I don't have to sort of react, right? That's that's a form of metacognition. Um, and I really liked how in the long section on lucid dreams of various sorts, really like how you kind of teased apart, again, some things that we tend to conflate and in the case of lucid dreaming, um, you point out, right, and rightly so, that it's been billed and marketed for 30 years or whatever as this way to get total control of your dreams, you know, this sort of sense of control, which implies this ego control of it, right? Whereas, um, but you kind of expand the definition of lucid dreaming. You're like, well, yeah, I mean, that's a type. I mean, that's sort of a you know, it's it's not particularly enlightened to want to do that. You get bored pretty quickly because once you can do that, it's sort of a parlor trick to this whole idea of of awareness and the metacognition aspects of lucid dreaming. And I, I really like that because it, you know, it makes it more of a continuum. You know, there's a, a lot of different kinds of lucidity we can get. There's spontaneous lucidity, which is what I usually have sort of a moment of coming in and then going back out of popping in, of, you know, and, and but then longer ones too. So maybe you could talk a little bit about just your um, your perspective on lucid dreaming in general and I guess, you know, kind of what what's the point, you know, is there a test at the end of this thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, so a lot of this, this metacognitive stuff is coming out of the research that Tracy Kahn has done and Stephen LeBurge. Uh, and, and Michael Schradel and some of the other um, dream researchers who are, are you know, doing cognitive psychology, uh, clinical stuff and, and surveys, and really breaking down concepts in a way that parses with modern psychology. Uh, and, so, and I think it's really helpful. I mean, metacognition is kind of a weird word, um, but it puts these things in perspective, like you said. Um, lucid dreaming, I don't really think there actually are lucid dreams. I think they're lucid moments. Ah. And, you know, and, and maybe this will be something that we will see better that will bear out um, in terms of research when we start looking at the brain more in future studies. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's totally a wave. It's like waking life, right? I mean, we have, um, we have moments where we're really perceptive and lucid and have metacognition. There are not very many of them <laughs> in, in our daily life. We are, generally, we are absorbed in our thoughts, we're absorbed in our monologue, we're seeing things from one perspective, from our perspective, we're not, you know, we're certainly not like gestalt perspectives on people we're having, you know, experiences with generally. Mm -hmm. um, all that stuff is in higher order stuff that comes and goes probably related to um, the, you know, the, the circadian rhythm and, mm -hmm. and how much we're in a daydream fugue and how much we're in a sort of autistic state of where we're really perceiving our own per perceptions and having awareness about that. So it's just 
first thing is that waking awareness is not monolithically awesome and highly perceptive and logical because that's a fallacy. Right. Um, and then breaking down and saying, hey, dreams also has this interesting spectrum too. It looks a little different. It's on a little farther down the line in terms of how our awareness is going, but you can still sort of moments of, of, of thinking and then moments of just going along with it. Uh, and have almost no awareness of what just happened. And your short-term memory is just shot completely. Like, <laughs> you know, <the> <laughs> right? And so, the lucid dreaming in perspective is that maybe there are no lucid dreams. It's just lucid moments. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing that you necessarily should be with them. It's naturally occurring. They they happen. It's part of the human experience. And and in different cultures, different training use and apply this wide array uh, you know, of, of functions, social mm -hmm. functions, uh, you know, spiritual, cultural, getting information, mm -hmm. reasons, and, you know, and then of course the Western pursuit has been largely in terms of the popular psychology, often about kind of scratching the itch of like, you know, your pleasure, pleasure dome, essentially. Right. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I think you know, how big really cognitive ability is. You know, people want to have dream sex, really safe sex. You're not hurting anybody. Right. Um, and the only thing I would say is, is that, of course, if you're entraining your brain to, like, try to, like, rape dream characters, uh, you know, in your dreams, that's probably not reflective well of the way you think in your waking life. Right. There are, you know, subtleties, I think, to this experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it, it's interesting. It's interesting. We can't just act one way in life and try to act it's dishonest, I think, to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. I, and, and, you know, <laughs> the whole thing about, uh, well, you know, psi dreams, okay, so... In the '60s, I think you know what happened is, I mean, it became it's it became a sort of a, a proxy for some sort of enlightenment, or it's, you know, it was just became kind of an ego trip. If you could have that kind of dream, you were that type of person who could think a little bit differently or had access to different parts of the mind. And I and I like how um, your stuff in particular, but also other people who are writing about lucid dreams. I mean, I'm thinking of Fariba and, and, you know, Kelly and a whole bunch of people, Stephen LaBerge definitely, are just, you know, there's a spectrum here. And just because you have these lucid moments, it doesn't, that doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't equate with anything. You know, it's, that's, that's part of the normal spectrum of human thought, and that's part of the normal functioning of the mind. Yeah, I do think so. I do think so. Although I, I do also think that there's certain behaviors that you can do in a lucid dream that will take you farther than others. And mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what that's about yet. Maybe it's about archetypal psychology. Maybe it's something about certain, certain neuro-gnostic structures in the brain. Mm -hmm. We're hardwired for certain experiences. Certain doors open easier than others. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've found with my own lucid dreams that certain things just work better if I take certain attitudes and, and you have certain expectations. And in general, that set of expectations is about being compassionate towards the entities who I am in conversation with right. uh, and, and noticing things like thresholds and sacred spaces and just sentences, basically. And being very aware of that, noticing how it changes. Mm -hmm. um, there's something very cool happening that does not have to do with my mental model of the world and my schema theory of like how I perceive reality. I think there really is something going on that we can tap into that takes you into deeper places of the psyche than others. And I'm very interested in learning more about that and exploring it. And one of the things that I found for instance, would be, you know, the using uh, using portals to take mm -hmm. you from one dream scene to another. Uh, and many of these dreamers have discovered this, and it's because it works. Just for some reason, the mind really is all about it. And mm -hmm. once you go through a portal, a new dream opens up, and these dreams can be 
become big dreams. Wow. I don't believe all lucid dreams are big dreams. All lucid dreams are not necessarily that lucid. They're not they're cool from you know that metacognitive perspective because they're unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, a lot of them are actually repetitive, and you find yourself in the same cognitive loop where, oh, I'm lucid again. Oh, I'm kind of horny. I'm going to go try to like, find right. something. Oh, I can't find anything. What's right. going on? <laughs> and then some kind of weird nightmarish thing happens. Yeah. Um, you know, like, that's you know, my cognitive loop. And I'm not really <laughs> um, so it's not like being lucid, it's like being connected to your higher self. I think that's a little simplistic. <laughs> but some of the times we do open up into these, these these worlds where we are somehow more than ourselves uh, and we're given gifts and opportunities. Uh, uh, and I think lucidity provides more of those. But in itself, lucidity is not, you know, spiritual or it's not, uh, you know what I mean? It's not, it, it is what you make of it. Right, so you could, I mean, <laughs> imagining lucid dreams as your own personal orgasmatron, you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. and they, like, oh good, I'm lucid dreaming, you know, quick, on the hunt, you know. Well, and, and people, people who, who are interested in sexuality and lucid dreams, I think uh, when they have the attitude that, you know, that it is like that you can just, you know, push a button and get what you want, right. um, you know, Ta-da, here it is. Like it works like, oh, I can manifest an apple in my lucid dream, you know. Oh, I can manifest some someone really, you know, attractive. Yes, you can, but that's not the way human sexuality works. Right. Um, we're wired for connection. Even if that connection is just for this moment right now, this fleeting moment, if you're not feeling and sharing something, the pleasure is gonna decrease and go away. And if you're tr if you're grasping and running for something, it's gonna run from you, and then you're then you're playing uh, cat and mouse. And so a lot of people uh, get frustrated with trying to have essential experiences with lucid dreaming because they're they're kind of treating you know dream characters like objects. Right. You know, it's interesting you're talking about um, your your go-to uh, behaviors in in your lucid dreams being towards compassion. Um, you know, I wonder if that's something that 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 switches. Like we we all are kind of working on a certain quality at a given any given time in our lives. Like I'll give you an example. I had this lucid dream, like kind of a lucid moment, a few months ago when I was. It had been after a day. I was just like go 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 work 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 work. Just like pushing it to the limit and got a lot done. I was feeling really good, really jazz. Go to sleep. Um, you know, kind of a little bit of insomnia in the middle of the night, and I'm drifting off to sleep again, um, probably three or so in the morning, and I dream that I'm in a, in my car, and I'm driving, it's a straight shot, it's at night, straight shot down this long, um, open highway, and then there's this beautiful city in the distance, it's like lit, you know, it's some, some big city, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, something. And, you know, it's just like a straight shot down the road. I'm like, cool, I want to go to this city. And as soon as I say that, the lane that's going my direction sort of veers off and it becomes this sort of bucolic pastoral scene with the curvy thing. And I have this moment of like, damn it, this is going to be one of those dreams. Like, okay, what am I going to do? Do I just like, because it's a dream, I can just like swerve the car and go back to where I want to go, or I can, you know, maybe there's going to be a turn off, I can go left again and back onto the road, and and I got, I, I quickly became just sick of all the choices, like, I don't want to just like, be okay, let's go with the flow going down this stupid stretch. It's not where I wanted to go, but I'm not satisfied. Like, I reject the premise of this dream is basically <laughs> was my feeling. Like, I'm not satisfied with any of my choices here. And so I got out of my car and I sat down in the middle of the road and I'm like, I'm going to sit here until I understand why this is happening in my dream. <laughs> like, like, direct action. That was my first direct action dream, I think. And then as soon as I did that, like sitting down on the pavement in my dream, I understand that if I'm driving toward the city, that is actually um, the same as keeping on with that like really high firing, high functioning mind. Whereas if I go down the, the curvy, the windy country road, that's more like going to sleep you know, it, it's more relaxing and it'll actually let me drift off to sleep. And I said, oh, 
Right. Yeah, I do need to go to sleep. So I got back in my car and started driving down the country road. And I and I and I literally kind of felt myself drifting off into sleep. And <laughs> it's like, wow, that was that was unusual. That's but I think but I, I think for me, I'm I'm that's kind of what I'm working on right now, like overcoming fear, overcoming anxiety, and in this particular I mean that was the first of a few where I just like I reject the premise of this dream. Like you're gonna have to come up with something else here because I'm not going for it. I'm tired of all these different choices. <laughs> yeah, that's great. What a great dream. I, when you were telling it, I had an image of Emerald City. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like that. It was like that. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I've been overwhelmed by choices and lucid dreams before too, and, and sometimes the dream just fades out as I'm sitting there. Uh, hovering in my, you know, indecision of what to do. Uh, and I remember this dream that's coming to me now is um, being in that moment and in the dream, uh, my mom was next to me, sitting next to me. I'm sitting against the wall and I'm kind of dejected and I'm like, I don't even know what this is for. Why am I here? What is this about? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just accept this scene as it is? Am I supposed to get out of this house, uh, you know, in... Yeah. In the dream, my mother says, well, why do you feel like you have to do anything? Oh. And I was like, that's that's an excellent point, Mom. <laughs> and I just sat there. And, I sat there. and uh, in, in, in that moment, in that dream, that was the right thing to do. Wow. It was just to relax and say, there's too many shoulds. Uh, this is just about appreciating the moment and, and actually appreciating, you know, hanging out with my mom in this dream. See, you know, maybe someday I will achieve that that uh, level of relaxation. <laughs> well, I think it, what, what, what's interesting is, is that you sat down in your dream, too, and you sat down yeah. in your room. Uh, <laughs> and there's something, that, you know, that that's cool. It's an invitation to sit. Uh, yeah. and, and often I found with my, with my lucid dreams and in my personal, I guess you could say, process over the decades is try, trying to stay put in the lucid dream is you know that's where I'm that's where I'm going that's what I've kind of been doing for the last few years because I'm really flighty mm -hmm. um, and, and this is very common with lucid dreamers is we are like oh we're lucid let's fly woo ah. we're off. And it's an adventure and that's great um, but now I'm very interested in I'm lucid I'm in this dream right here I'm going to stay in this role in the scene what's here for me What's you know what what's going to come up uh, in trying to stay put to stay grounded? That is a challenge for me. Uh, wow. so that's one of the things I'm working on. Now that's really interesting. See, I, I actually I really like that. I mean, I, I I guess it's my frame of mind anyway. My sort of natural bent is to be working on a specific thing that uh, that 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 will compensate for things that I kind of do too much. That seems like a really useful practice. I mean, I guess that's my my overall view of dreams. Really, is that if I if um, if I become aware in my dream, I use it as a practice of some sort. And certainly, I mean, dream work for me historically is is been a big part of my spiritual practice. You know, um, being in a dream group for a really long time. But um, I I just really like that whole perspective on dreams. That it's uh, that that one type of dream isn't necessarily better than another that it's not always about what action we can take it's not always about how high we can fly or how you know deep we can dive um, sometimes and, and you say that you have this beautiful thing I think it, it, you're quoting Fariba um, in the book about um, something just being receptive you want to talk about receptivity a little bit right and this is I think a missing piece in in dream culture, and in particular in lucid dreaming culture, in terms of consciousness, which is having just the space to listen to the dream answer you. Mm -hmm. So, and, and lucid dreamers are really great at coming up with experiments and asking questions um, on our own terms, uh, not so good at listening to what the dream has to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, I've had dreams where I've you know shut dream characters down so I could ask my question. <laughs> when you look at it, it's so messed up. It's, uh, 
yeah, it's kind of obvious in retrospect, but it's like, no, 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 no. I'm trying to find out what you have to say to me. So <laughs> quiet for a second and let me, let me talk to you. <laughs> right? <laughs> let me ask the question perfectly phrased. Right, so, so receptivity, it's not, it's not victimhood. We have this idea that, that consciousness must be active. Well, that's just one posture. It's just one way of you know, being aware in the dream. And receptivity is, is sitting and waiting and being patient um, and seeing what self arises and reacting to that. And this, you know, for Fariba, she's a phenomenologist. She trained me in phenomenology. And it's about having a nice sort of compassionate outlook and, and without having it, trying to think about what's going to happen next and noticing your own perceptions what might happen next, very much like meditation in an Eastern sense. Mm -hmm. And just being open to the moment as itself arises. I mean, that's why phenomenology, I really think it is a Western tradition of meditation and it isn't really discussed like that because it has so much clouded language around it in the linguistic, you know, uh, scholarly languaging. It's just kind of awful. Uh, but the practice of phenomenology itself, it is a meditation in which you sit and see how things react, kind of like in, in Gurdian science uh, being another, you know, another aspect of that sort of nature self arises. How does it present itself? And how can we account for our own biases and actually see nature in a, in a, in a more clear sense without projecting or, you know, whatever onto it? Uh, and so receptivity is, is really hard to do. Uh, but once you, once, you, once you get the hang of it, um, it, it becomes a wonderful, a wonderful way for the dream to hold you, you know, like a receptacle. It, it nice. will hold you aloft. That's lovely. That's a beautiful image, and I, I think that's actually a nice place to pause. I'm saying pause because I know I'll be talking to you again. <laughs> At least I hope so. Um, so, yeah. So let's let people. Let's uh, let's see. I can tell people and show people the uh, the book cover. This is uh, Ryan Hurd's book, Big Dreams. You can see that there. Big dreams. Psy, Lucid Dreaming, and Borderlands of Consciousness. And Ryan, you've got your website at dreamstudies.org. People can pick up your book there, correct? That's right. And, and also, also, the book the book's book's now, the Dream Studies Press is dreamstudies.com. Oh, good. But you can go to .org as well and find your way there. Awesome. And anything else you want to tell people I'm, uh, that's anything coming up? Well, um, I did want to actually share something that I've been working on that I haven't even told you about, I don't think. Uh, and that is that I've designed with a partner of mine a new kind of induction, lucid dreaming induction device. Oh, cool. The coin. And it's called the Alzheimer. Oh. Wow. And the uh, concept of the lucid talisman is, is that you hold it in your pocket. And every time you put your hand in your pocket, you do a reality check. Oh, nice! I had a lot of fun designing this thing um, with my with my buddy and working on the mythology of it. Kind of, you know, it has a sun side and a moon side. To it. Uh, and I'm going to be offering these on DreamStudies.com really soon. Hopefully, for the launch, you know, it'll fit better. That's great because that's, I mean, that practice of like, am I awake? Am I dreaming? And um, having that little anchor in your pocket, what a great idea. It, you know, it, it was inspired by Inception. Uh huh. You've seen that movie, I assume. Yes. Uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio you know, as Cobb, he has uh, a spinning top. Right. The top, right? right. And so he, 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 he knows if he's dreaming or not, the top is where he is awake, spinning, he knows he's in a dream. And I always loved that concept, but I was like, oh, wait, hold on. You're going to create a, a false positive there because you could have a dream where the top actually topples over. And then you right. say, oh, awake, and it would be false. Right, right. And so the whole idea of the talisman is, is it's got a text on it that you can use it to actually like look at and study it and then flip it around and it, and it actually spins to put on a table and it'll spin. 
That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. It's, been, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun working on a physical product. Cause, you know, I mostly write, you know, do ebooks and right. stuff that's like either. So uh, it's been fun to do something that's tangible. <laughs> that's great. I'm so excited. I want one. I got to order one as soon as they're get, as soon as they're available. Yeah, they'll be, they'll be out really soon. So that's that's what's next. That's what I'm working on now. Very cool. Well, Ryan, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, and really glad we got to to uh, chat about your new book. And you and I will be talking hopefully soon um, about when you're. Um, uh, we'll do some big group chats about your lucid dreaming anthology, which actually, look at I have it right here. This is coming up next, people. Look at that. Two volumes. Oh, my God. I can't wait. Just, <laughs> wait, say that again? It's just such a beat, you know? Like, uh, I, I actually, I now I'm using the anthology myself for references. And it's great because I have... I'm finally far enough removed from it that I can I can read it, and, and it's a really awesome resource. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I can say that right away because I didn't have to write any of it or edit it, so it's totally awesome. That 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 is on the books for later this spring. Um, more power to you. I'm just uh, I love hearing about what you're up to, and um, can't wait to see what's next. Uh, <laughs> All right, take care.